Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Let's see if Hi. I can get a, hold on a second while I try for some better background. Is this Kyle? Yes, I am Kyle. Nice to finally meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you so much for doing this Discord thing. It is such a wonderful thing. Um, yes. Um, I really like your uh, Zoom profile picture. That's uh, well, <laughs> Miss Frizz from the Magic School Bus. Yeah, I thought you guys are too young to know about that one. That was no. when my kids were little. No, no, no. No, I re no actually, no. yeah, I know the Magic School Bus. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah, she's my hero. Mm. I hope one day to be as inspiring. She uh, also had a school bus that could take her inside the human body. So, like, it's a yeah. little t challenging to... How do I say how to, to kind of match that kind of resources, but uh, we can all do it. <laughs> we got to try. Now let's see if this is going to work. Uh, did that work? Start video. Okay, that's a little bit better. Not my usual background, but I'm not at my usual desk. So. It is totally okay. I do not even have a background, so I have my... Uh, I. I have my uh, room in my back, but it is okay. So, <laughs> hello so, every hello everyone. Welcome to the UCSB Physics Discord stream. We are honored to have Professor Deborah Feigenson with us today, and um, we are going to be running for an hour like usual. And if you have not already, check us out on the Discord or on Twitch chat. We'll be taking live questions on the Twitch chat and the Discord. And without further ado, let's begin. So Professor Feigenson, how are you today? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you, Kyle? Um, well, these streams are really fun, actually. Like, it gives me a chance to interact with professors that like, I normally don't get a chance to. And like, I get to speak as like a, as, like, a representative of a large part of the student body. So it kind of, it's a little bit of a responsibility and it's a bit of a task to juggle all the uh, different chat rooms I have to manage while talking to you. But honestly, it's pretty <laughs> fulfilling. It's pretty fulfilling. Um, I think it's amazing. I'm really, I'm a big uh, fan of what you, the Discord is doing for the department. Yeah. If you can see, uh, Kenneth right now is the one managing the stream and you can see him. Uh, it's, uh, if you see on his screen, you have you in the center, I'm in the top left corner, and then we have three different chat channels all available for all the users to see. So we've got a pretty good setup here. Okay, I'm gonna let you manage that. I'm not, all I can do is yeah, to just look at this. just focus on just focus on a conversation with me, and I'll take care of everything with the users. That's good. Uh, so I'd like to begin with um, how you came to be at UCSB. Like, give us a background of your academic journey starting from undergraduate and mm -hmm. culminating at how you became a professor at UCSB. Okay, uh, well, let's see. I don't know, maybe it's a little bit interesting to go one step further back. I went to a public high school in the suburbs of Chicago and um, nobody really got it, um, what being excited about science was like. I had a wonderful chemistry th teacher uh, and then I, I went to MIT and that was just the place for me, full of people who liked science the way I did and didn't mind uh, kind of getting nerdy or geeking out about stuff. So that was a wonderful place and time. I didn't really know that I wanted to do physics because uh, I had a really terrible high school experience in physics, not a very good teacher. Um, it's not that it was um, hard, it just wasn't interesting for some reason. Um, but I really enjoyed it in college. And so I thought I was gonna be an engineer. And um, one of the formative experiences of my youth was an energy crisis where there wasn't, uh, we were waiting for hours in line at a gas station to get gas for the car. And I thought, this is stupid. I gotta be part of fixing this. Like I think a lot of the undergraduates these days are looking around at some of the silly things that are happening geopolitically and thinking they wanna be part of the solution. So that was me back then. And I thought maybe nuclear energy would be the thing. And uh, that for that, you know, signed me up to learn physics. And then I just, I just loved the physics. And what's more, I really liked the other people who were studying physics. Like they found the same sorts of jokes funny. They found the same kind of shows interesting. And so that just made me think, I, I 
not really thought of myself as a physicist. My family didn't think of me as one, but uh, it was clearly where I was enjoying my time most. So I decided to go with that. And um, I ended up doing an undergraduate thesis in a lab. I had a great graduate student mentor and um, enjoyed it a lot. I, I wrote a thesis and, um, and said, yeah, okay, I like doing this, so I'm gonna try and do it for grad school. I applied widely. Um, I had met my husband by then, actually. I'm a little bit unusual that way to have, um, I got married at about 21 years of age, so maybe even younger than some of you guys. Um, and we had a, a two body problem right off the bat, trying to figure out where we would go. And, uh, and so um, I ended up going to Princeton because it was convenient for where he was going next and um, not for many other reasons. <laughs> and it wasn't a great fit at first. Um, they had brought in a lot of women my year. We, there were seven of us in my incoming class. And a year and a half later, there were four. And I think three of us actually ended up uh, finishing the program. But about a year or two in, I finished, they had qualifying exams and I, I finished that and I decided I wanted to be somewhere else. So I applied widely, but one of the professors that I went to ask for a letter of recommendation, cause he had to renew your letters, um, said, you know, we just hired this guy. Maybe, maybe you could stay, maybe you'd like working with them. And so I went to look into it and that was, that ended up being my, my mentor, my PhD advisor. And it was a wonderful experience for me. Um, finding the right mentor, I think, is really important. Uh, somebody that you trust to criticize you, that's still going to have your back, even though they see all your flaws and, and it help you work through them. So I had a very positive graduate school experience um, because of him and the culture he created in his lab. And uh, then I went... Uh, he actually moved labs while I was with him. It's not such an unusual thing to happen to a graduate student. Faculty sometimes hop around during their careers. And, um, and that was an interesting experience as a graduate student, actually having to see a lab pack down and pack up and restart was, um, you know, it probably took a little time out of my trajectory, but it was worth it to kind of feel like, oh yeah, I could do this. I could set up a lab. And uh, so I ended up spending a year post PhD with the same advisor just in the new lab. And that was, that was really good. And then I took a postdoc. Um, and I was two years at USC in LA. Again, um, it was to kind of manage the two body problem with my husband. And um, it ended up was it it was a bit of a challenging postdoc for me because I, I took one in molecular biology. I had done already biological physics for my PhD. And I felt like, you know, I don't really know biology and I should try and figure it out a little bit uh, if I'm gonna try and be relevant and take a lot of information from that field. But I found the culture was really uh, different and I didn't like it as much as I liked the physics culture. So I, it was a little bit worried, how do I find my way back? But um, UCSB advertised and I applied to there and a couple other places kind of early on in my in my postdoc after only a couple of years. And I was lucky enough to get the position and I've been there ever since. So that's how I ended up at UCSB. And my husband stayed at USC and we managed that uh, 100 mile separation for 20 years. Wow, that sounds great. Um, it's, it sounds pretty incredible though, because if I heard that right, you started off in nuclear physics. That's what my, my declared like freshman major was. Yeah. Okay. So then how did you transition from nuclear physics to molecular biology to eventually teaching? Did you, did I mishear it? Was that molecular so biology? I, went, I, did I did nuclear engineering. Then I left and I majored in physics at okay. MIT and I did my PhD in physics at Princeton. And then I thought, okay, but my PhD in physics was one of the first PhDs in a physics department, I think, where biology materials were studied. Um, and after, you know, learning more than my advisor about what biology was, I knew what I didn't know, which was a lot of 
biology. So I took a postdoc, you know, with my PhD, I, I went and I applied to labs of um, biologists that knew physics, you know, could understand and appreciate what I knew, but would also give me the opportunity to learn stuff I didn't know. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's something that's helpful for students to hear is that you're not hired for what you know all the time. You're hired for how well you know how to learn and how, um, how well you can bring the tools you do have to bear in a different context. So, um, so I did get that opportunity. And um, I think that also being a woman uh, was a little bit of an expectation that I was gonna be more of a biologist, which really didn't mm -hmm. fit me at all. Uh, so mm -hmm. that was a funny thing, but you know, uh, I think it's worked out well for me in the end. Um, we have a question from the Discord. Min Nguyen <laughs> asks, when it came to doing biophysics from a more physics background, what and how did you catch up on biology knowledge? So biology, from my point of view, is like a different language. Physics uses math for its language a lot. And biologists are amazing logicians. They really are super rigorous and just not as quantitative often. I mean, I think that's changing in the last decade, but um, there's a lot of variability in the systems that they study that make it hard to be as um, quantitative as, you know, sort of uh, precisely quantitative as we enjoy in physical phenomena. And um, so I, so actually the entry point to biology is just enjoying reading and learning their language. There's a lot of vocabulary out there and you, you know, can't be embarrassed that you just have to learn it. And you read and you talk and you listen to their, them talk about their work and you ask them about it. And that's how you learn. You don't actually, I mean, taking classes is a very concentrated way to get exposed to materials, to, to a subject matter. And it's helpful and useful that way. But um, it's not that hard to pick up biology. Also because it's kind of rich, you can afford to stay pretty narrow in biology and really dive down into a particular subject area and be able to, um, to grasp it all and bring other tools to bear. So I guess you can't, well, I guess things may be changing now with so much video content available, but in my time, you couldn't afford not to enjoy reading outside of your field. I had to read a lot of biology. I have another question from the Discord. Robin Glefke, uh, apologies everyone if I'm mispronouncing your username or your real names. Um, I'm doing this on the fly, so I give my apologies in advance. Robin Glefke asks, I'm managing a two body problem myself. How did you do that for so long? Oh, um, yeah, so we did what worked for us. Every couple, I guess, is different and uh, we, we kind of just tag teamed it. We made one decision uh, prioritizing his position and one, the next decision we prioritized mine and we, we were good about trading off like that. And we didn't want to put either person in the position of feeling that they really compromised irreversibly for the other. So it, it's one of those things you kind of take it step by step. I don't think, um, you know, there, our department's been reasonably good at, at taking on couples. We have a number of coupled faculty and you can talk with them to know more about negotiating as a couple for a position. Cause we don't, my, my husband and I are actually 10 years apart career wise. And so um, we were at very different stages and negotiating as a couple wasn't really in our game plan. So we kind of just managed it one-on-one. -on -one. For our user, can we have the names of those couples in the department? Uh, I believe sure. Anya, who's it? Uh, Anya Jayich. Anya Blazinski Jayich and Andrew Jayich are one couple. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess Beth Gwynn and her husband Carl Gwynn are now retired. Um, but, you know, Don Maroff and uh, Crystal Martin are a couple. They actually, I think, met here. So they independently got their jobs in the department and then um, became a couple. Um, let's see, who else do we have? 
I feel like there's one more that I might not be appreciating. And I don't want to embarrass myself. Let's see if I remember. Okay, that's fine. Um, so what differentiates biology from biophysics and like how much overlap and how much uh, non-overlap is there? That's a great question. So what differentiates biology uh, from, from physics is it's actually kind of an aesthetic. Uh, I have a, a pretty good friend from undergrad who became a, who was a physics major who became a biology professor. And we were at a, a meeting, a biophysical society meeting once together, we shared a room and we had that conversation. And she's like, well, you know, biologists like to wonder at their navel. They're like sitting there and wonder what the lint is and what the bugs are. And they, they find the, they find the phenomena of life kind of fascinating and the details and the, the variation intriguing. Physicists look and are more by and large fascinated and intrigued by principles, by things that transcend the details and uh, might, might allow a kind of creativity an unexpected creativity. There's a huge amount of creativity in biology too. It often comes from harvesting something you found in that one special bug that was glowing green at night in the ocean and using it in this other bug to you know light up their developmental pathway or something it, that's it's super creative that way too but it really has more to do with the meaning of the word understand and in physics when we say we understand something we mean we have abstracted a principle that's got predictive power in a lot of scenarios and in biology, when they say they've understood something, they mean they know with great confidence and detail what that phenomenon is, like what exactly is happening to create the phenomenon at, at a molecular scale with good temporal resolution. It's, it seems descriptive and, and sometimes physicists will poo-poo it as stamp collecting, but it's actually a tricky, tricky puzzle. And it can be a fun game to solve. I mean, if, if you're the kind of person that likes solving puzzles, you might appreciate it, mm. but it's different culturally. So for example, can I ref, I'll riff on this one more thing? Cause one of the, yeah, go the ahead, things please. that really excites me in, in biology, I think of as a biological problem, which is how could life possibly originate, right? Mm -hmm. How did life originate is a historical question that I don't know that we'll ever answer. For with, with a lot of confidence, but how it could originate, what are the principles by which life could originate? You'll find that not many biologists would study that, that they would think they're, they're really interested in the biology that exists now and understanding it. Oh, you're still there? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. And, Sorry about um, that. Okay. And, and they're not interested in stuff they can't prove and witness and control. So how, you know, what the molecular soup was is, is about as amusing to them as, um, you know, what COVID is, is amusing to us. We're kind of curious because it affects us, but we wouldn't think of it as physics necessarily. Um, and that's their attitude towards the question of originating or of, um, what do they call it? The transition to, living, to the living state. Mm -hmm. But I think every physicist would look at that and say, Darn, that's an interesting question. <laughs> There's a principle like, there. Yeah. From something non-living to something living, what's necessary? What can we learn from the examples that we see of living things? And, you know, what's just accident and what's essential? So maybe that helps illustrate the difference between uh, physics and biology around the same phenomenon. No, that, that makes sense. So it's just like, like, where does the... Um... Like, where does it go from just chemical reactions to like almost like directed purpose chemical reactions? Just like that, there's like that link between like, the, like there's just that's that link, that magical link where like, how do you differentiate between something that's like, has a purpose in its reaction versus something that just reacts? That's kind of the way I kind of see it. Um, yeah, personification is such a, a, a strong instinct in our psychology and it works pretty well. But I think you're confusing with purpose. You're just sort of confusing with uh, selective, you know, a selective pressure, an ability to oh. uh, overtake the system. Uh, that looks like it's the intent of stuff, but it's it could just be the outcome 
of a certain dynamic where the energy flows. Okay. Um, we have a question from the Discord uh, from Meredith. She asks, uh, what has your experience been like specifically as a woman in physics? It's interesting. Um, I've seen a sort of sea change in, um, in the attitudes of your average physicist. Um, the generation of my parents, my mom was actually a physicist. She got a PhD in physics back at a time when, you know, a lot of women didn't even work and, uh, or it didn't work outside the home, I should say. And she faced a fair amount of just inequality, like lower pay than somebody that was doing less work and lower level work than she was and things like that, that she had to fight for. Uh, her generation actually broke down a lot of barriers for me and mine. Um, so I didn't have as much of that, but I think that um, my generation of my peers, like my male colleagues, they're all you know, thinking of their daughters as career, potential career women, right? And they're much more um, egalitarian. There's still, I think the biggest, the, the two biggest things that, that were challenges for me in my uh, career that might be linked to my gender were one was, um, was social at the even undergraduate level um, mm. where I mentioned, you know, I got married pretty early. Part of it was really just trying to find a way to be to have friends for peers instead of always potential romantic partners. Uh, when there's a huge mismatch, that's a challenge. And you want, to, um, you want to feel like you're part of the group, but it can be very difficult to, to draw those boundaries. It was in that generation at least. Um, and then it was also then managing children. I have two children, um, super proud of them. And uh, they're both uh, girls and uh, one is now in her first year of graduate school and the other wow. is entering eighth grade. Wow. No, entering ninth grade, the other's in eighth grade. And uh, so raising children and figuring that out might, my husband's a bit more traditional, so having him co-parent was uh, was more difficult, uh. I think, than it is with folks of your generation. Mm. Um, and so those were the two challenges that I faced, I think, because of my gender in physics, primarily. I um, so uh, I will say, though, that I came into this... Um, field for the people. I really do mm -hmm. like the people and I, I still do. I mean, I think that my colleagues are a great group of people who generally do have a principle of treating everybody on the basis of their performance and character and not uh, stereotyping people into gender roles. That's so I, and I think UCSB is actually a particularly good place this that, way. That sounds great. Um, we have a question from the Discord from Michael. Uh, any advice for managing a good work-life balance? No. Oh. I think um, maybe get good at forgiving yourself. Okay. Because forgiving honestly, yourself. I don't think there's... I think the balance is really hard and you drop things on one side and on the other, and you just have to, um, you know, it's frustrating and it's, um, it's hard. You want to maybe not judge yourself too much on the basis of that and try to judge more on, um, you know, the thing that you did put your attention to and really did concentrate, how well did you make that happen? Recognizing that that cost over here and that none of these is, is the be all and the end all of, of your self-worth. Um, but 
Okay, one other thing. Mm -hmm. Employ somebody to help you raise your kids. I mean, don't be (laughs) feeling like only you can love your children. Honestly, the more people who love your children, the better. (laughs) And (laughs) your children will always know who their parents are. And those, you know, it's... It's not true that if you pay somebody to help you with your children, they they do it for the money and they can't love them as well. And I just, there is still a little bit of a taboo against um, childhood help that I think needs to be broken. I think it's maybe a relic of the fact that that kind of work was often unpaid labor. And so there was some sense that it has to be unpaid labor to be high quality. And I don't think it's it's true. And, um, and having uh, help in that domain is tremendous. It just, there's nothing, raising a kid is a lot of work. It's just plain old hard work. And I am infinitely grateful for the folks who have helped me along the way, that they have been uh, excellent, caring professionals. I also had, uh, my parents also had a, uh they had someone else look after me and my sister when I grew up. And I definitely felt that like, you know, that helped them because they were both career professionals. Uh, And I definitely agree with your advice that like my parents were able to advance their career and they were able to do well. And um, I honestly still love my parents, obviously. And I I appreciated the help, the, the, my babysitters, I always appreciated them, but like, yeah, uh, I still have, I still love my parents too. So like, I think what you say is very correct. I will, I will share a little anecdote, though. My younger daughter, uh, for many of her younger years, she was like, oh, mommy, I wish you didn't work so much. I wish that you were around. Da, 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 da. Um, my mom gave me this tip because apparently I was maybe a bit like that, too. Um, they appreciate you when they're older. It can be hard for the really young ones to understand, especially if they're surrounded by other kids who have, you know, their parents at home, I have a parent for a caregiver, but um, I certainly appreciated, you know, my mom having shown me the way, and I know my older daughter sees it now, and I think uh, the younger one will see it very soon, so. We have another question from the Discord. Uh, Jacob mm-hmm. asks, how do you feel about the new physics curriculum, specifically with the new labs and the CS course? I am super excited. I cannot tell you what a tremendous job Omer has done. It is huge. I am uh, been lobbying for it for a long time. Sorry, I'm going to close this door so it's a little bit quieter. Um, we really needed a more uh, time intensive sophomore lab experience uh, for a long time. And now the fact that we have two unit labs for the sophomores is going to make a tremendous difference in just giving them more confidence and preparedness to get involved in research if they're experimentally inclined. I think that that's tremendous, and it um, and then getting the exposure to some amount of computer use and programming and um, and 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 math earlier on. That's also going to be great. I. I'm deeply indebted to Omar and the other colleagues that actually made that come to pass. Speaking of research, um, we have a question here um, about your research. What about your current research excites you the most? Oh, well, there's two aspects. One, I am studying natural technology. Okay. That for me is just fascinating. So I know a lot of you get excited about physics from, you know, star stuff and fundamental particles and things. I was the kind of kid who always, you know, wanted to understand what superpowers were and how do I make them? And, you know, why does a knife cut butter better than my finger? And why is tape sticky and not my own hand, right? Uh, sometimes my own hand is sticky. And I, I just wanted to understand the fundamentals of these, what turned out to be very material qualities. Because to me, understanding the fundamentals is the root of creativity. And I never expected um, when I went into physics that I would 
end up in biology. But when I got that opportunity uh, to look at biology, I learned that it's an awful lot of technology that is naturally occurring. There are machines that arose with no human intervention. And you can you know, use that as some sort of insight into uh, some cosmic being with a, with a magic hand, but I find it more a trace of beauty and order in the universe to try and understand the principles by which technology can arise and how it works. This technology lives at the subcellular scale. It's, it's macromolecular in its size and actions. And I'm really curious about how to harness it in a fundamental way, in a non-biological way. So what biologists do is they mine it. They, they go, they find the technology that they need. They, they crack open a cell and take it out and put it in another cell or do something else with it. And that's super clever. But the kind of creativity I want would require being able to build it from the ground up with principles. You know, I don't know if they still teach, you know, elementary school kids about the seven basic machines, the, the raw, the lever and the spring and the uh, wedge oh, and that. the gear and stuff like that. But I'm, you know, that's not, in the end, the most productive way to understand mechanics, but it really does capture kind of a reductionist point of view about machinery. And what are those basic elements in a molecular machine? So we're building little molecular machines in my group. And um, my graduate student, she's managed to make a very simple one. It's, uh, it's not a machine in the sense of, consuming a fuel to generate a force, but it is like a, a machine, like a, like a compass is a machine or, or a, it's not, it's more of a measuring tool, but it, it does require us to be able to design and build a molecule to do what we want it to do and for us to be able to interpret it. I'm really excited about our ability to do that. And then this particular machine is, is a, we call it an unchuck. It basically is a, a weak hinge. Okay. And I'm really looking forward to activating it to make something that actually moves back and forth under my control uh, or pinches back and forth under my control. People have done that at the very molecular scale uh -huh. and our structures come up to the micron scale. So okay. that's what excites me. Then the other thing is what can I learn about where life might arise in the future or how it might have arisen in the past. And here, the question that I find fascinating that I think we might have a handle on is, oh, so everything about biology is overcoming entropy. Entropy is huge at the molecular scale. And so you have to find ways to harness it. And, um, and in order to have the chemical reactions take place that characterize the living state, the ones that compete and, and, and multiply, replicate themselves, you can't have them in a big old soup. Uh, you know, the original soup can't be a pond. That's just too huge. You won't get the concentrations that you need for the reactions to proceed at a good rate. Okay. So you have to confine them in a small volume. All life as we know it is covered in a membrane membrane is made out of fat basically mm -hmm. and fat isn't protein it isn't nucleic acid it's not encoded in the genome in any way so it's really hard to imagine how the first cell might have arisen with a fat skin because you can't get stuff in and out of it so i think that that fat is a higher order invention and that probably the first um confined volumes were droplets droplets of, of materials like nucleic acids that mm -hmm. aggregated and condensed in solution, they're still uh, weakly bound and they just make a volume that's different. They have a, a surface tension, they make a droplet and other smaller molecules can live inside and even be preferentially concentrated inside of them in order to do their work. So we're learning, we're studying droplets of uh, made out of nucleic acid nanostructures and I think 
I'm really excited to see if we can get those droplets to, you know, selectively encapsulate other molecules up to a concentration that would let reactions happen that wouldn't, if the droplet didn't form. I see. Fascinating. That's so it's right. like an, it's like an enclosed environment that kind of gives like special, like isolation, like that kind of isolation is important. And yet it's just like, like, you know, it, you said that they weren't, there weren't genes for fat droplets. They just kind of happened. Well, fat skins, they're made out of these molecules that there's a whole suite of proteins responsible for synthesizing them. Okay. So some people think, you know, fat molecules could have been in the early soups and just sort of come together and happen to encase enough material, but then the sizes don't add up. Things are so small, you don't get enough molecules together that easily. So I think that fats probably started as coatings to droplets of other things. And then eventually um, you could have droplets that were good at producing the fats that then protected oh. them off, that Fasc kind of thing. Fascinating. So. I have a question from the Discord uh, from Grace. Yeah. What would you say is the difference between soft condensed matter and biophysics? I don't see a difference. I know there's two different divisions in the American Physical Society. And I guess um, the bio division has people who are a little, tends to aggregate people who are closer to studying actual biological systems, like they'll, they'll purify out proteins and, and work only in terms of those proteins and maybe try to be relevant to the physics that's happening inside a cell, measuring the mechanics of cells and things like that. And then the soft folks are more along the lines of, you know, use biological materials, but just study the properties of, of things that are also totally not biological. Um, uh, swimmers, whether they're bacteria or uh, little hydrogen propelled colloids are, are equally interesting in soft. You know, I don't think it, it matters much. I think in, in bio, you'll find nobody who doesn't know basic biology, whereas in soft, you might find folks that never learn biology. Mm. But these days, it's kind of just a unrounded scientific education if you don't know any biology, right? You should know some chemistry, you should know some biology. Um, just like we expect the chemists and biologists should know some physics. I think that the distinction is maybe not all that helpful. Mm. So um, really there is no, so you're saying there really is just like, it's just like, an, like a category difference or like a, a naming difference, but really the essence of the two fields are the same. Like, like the difference between physics and biology, it comes down to an aesthetic, I think, okay. of whether or not you really um, think that relevance to the living state is crucial, uh, the living state as we currently know it, um, that would tend to put you more into bio. Uh, whereas if you think that that's kind of incidental and you're really much more about just... Um, the stat mech and the material properties uh, that would put you more into soft. But I don't think anybody's well served by trying to draw a very sharp mm. distinction. Okay. I have a question from the discord. Men Nguyen asks, do you generally have to be pretty focused and picky about what you decide to do research on, or is it pretty loosey goosey, whatever you feel like doing? There's no question that to make progress, you have to focus, right? Uh, there is room to explore, but you, you know, loosey goosey won't get you to an actual result. Mm. So um, I think you end up having to choose and nail something. That being said, you can nail things on a five-year time scale. It's like a PhD. I feel like my life has been doing PhD after PhD after PhD. I just get to keep deciding, um, you know, new topics to dive into. Um, so 
I don't think you have to take your whole career and stay narrowly focused on one set of phenomena to really mm. make an impact. I think that it actually can be quite healthy and invigorating to become a freshman again, basically. You we all know how uncomfortable it can be to be a freshman, uh, but it's very healthy. You kind of throw off uh, your preconceived notions, you're humble again in the face of nature, and you dive in. But you've got a progress is only made with a lot of intense focus. Uh, another question from the Discord. Keen Lee asks, do you believe in the idea that quantum mechanics have significant effects on the rise of consciousness or consciousness or consciousness is just a nonlinear classical problem that has yet to be fully understood? I really like that hypothesis by Matthew Fisher. I think that's really exciting. Uh, that's the only hypothesis I know. I mean, I remember it, um, Roger Penrose's hypothesis about um, coherent uh, excitations in microtubules came out when I was doing my PhD on microtubules and it immediately didn't seem very likely to me. I knew too much about both quantum mechanics and microtubules to think of it as plausible. There's just too much noise. I mean, thermal energy is huge and the theorists, I think they weren't used to thinking about it enough. Um, they were pretty used to T equals zero approximations being relevant and they're not. Um, but Matthew has a really intriguing idea that uh, there can be long lived spin coherent, nuclear spin coherence uh, inside a particular pyrophosphate, I think it is, or some particular um, salt that's common in biology. And I would, I, I'm excited to see that tested. I think it would explain a certain kind of creativity uh, if there was an effect of quantum mechanics somewhere playing a role in how uh, thoughts are embodied physically. I think the question of what is the physical embodiment of a thought is the question for this millennium. Uh, the physical embodiment of the gene was a beautiful idea. If you ever get a chance to read Erwin uh, Schrodinger's What is Life? It's a really beautiful uh, way to pose the question and it made a huge difference in the way people approached biology. And I think um, looking for uh, quantum mechanical phenomena in the physical embodiment of thought is a very, um, has a good chance of being fruitful, but it needs some very special uh, system that can overcome thermal noise. Does sound very tough. Uh, another question from the Discord. Robin asks, what is your favorite or most cool thing you have learned or discovered in your career? Um, the one that has helped me organize the most of the new things I've learned about um, biological phenomena and the natural phenomena that underpin biology is just that notion that if anything can happen in biology, it will. So I remember um, the one of the frustrating things uh, someone with a physics aesthetic experiences when they come to biology is that, you know, there's like no principles <laughs> and you can't question why, you know, why, why is this system so freaking ornate? You, know, you can seemingly create these wonder molecules that do such complex things. Why not just make the molecule that gets you from step A to step D? Why do you have to go through B and C in between? Um, I don't really know the answer to that, but I remember as a, uh, the grad student flipping through an advertising type uh, newsletter that came from one of the molecular biology companies and reading about these things called intines. I don't know if you've had enough molecular biology to know what an intron is, Kyle? I no? unfortunately don't, but our listeners, our listeners may. Our listeners may. Okay. Well, if you learned a, a at all about DNA and RNA and protein in high school, they may have mentioned to you that there are genes in the DNA and that the DNA gets translated into RNA or as like transcribed into RNA. 
And at that time, there's some editing that takes place and little pieces of it get cut out of the transcript and pieced back together. The pieces that are coding are the exons and the pieces that get removed are called the introns. Mm -hmm. And this is just, you know, something the biologists had figured out is the case. And it's pretty impressive that there's this self-splicing that happens. Nobody had ever told me that the same phenomenon could take place in proteins. So when the RNA gets translated into protein, sometimes parts of that protein sequence clip themselves out and leave the other behind to make the final protein. So there are these in teens, these little bits of protein that come out. And if you think about it, why wouldn't there be? There's not an obvious inhibition of that. Like what, what's the cost? What's the lack of fitness if you have an inti. If it can exist, it will, and it will persist, and then it will find a use. So it's this organizing principle that, you know, I think I mentioned it once in the Discord, there's kind of something ergodic going on, like biology is trying freaking everything. Given enough time, it will, and the thing that, that uh, can provide a certain advantage in the current context is gonna, or not a disadvantage, will persist and perhaps even overtake what you see. I think just incorporating that into my scientific outlook is perhaps one of the more core things. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's something that I contributed particularly, but maybe it answers the question. Uh, Sean, I'll get to your question in a bit. Uh, Sid asks, out of all the undergraduate physics classes besides the biophysics classes, which classes would you say are most relevant to your field? I'm guessing someone might, maybe wants to get an in in your research and wants to know what first <laughs> steps to take. Um, I think that I learn, I mean, everything is, is really, it, it builds on itself so much, but really stat mech is mech. where my love fell, right? That, that, the, the kind of insight that that represents to these huge macroscopic phenomena about you know how gases work can be described by the Newtonian mechanics of how atoms bounce off each other. Just that blows me away. And that that is the aesthetic that we look for. We want to really understand things. We wanna understand them that well. Um, so I would say that a good understanding of, of stat mech um, is, is like, a, if you like stat mech, if you like that topic, then you might really like soft and living matter. Sounds very good. Um, what advice do you have? This is from Sean. Uh, what advice do you have on being a productive researcher? Um, Okay, research is a long game. You have got to like the process because the uh, positive feedback can be quite distant. You you have to go kind of a long time before you necessarily get that fix. Um, So I think finding something that you enjoy the process of, like if you love programming, then, you know, keep it in your research portfolio. If you love crafting, doing stuff with your hands, put that into your research portfolio so that you like the mechanics, the day in, day out of what it takes to tame nature till it teaches you something, it has to be enjoyable. Then you become research productive because honestly, it just takes a lot of your time. It's just gonna take a lot of work and I can't explain it, but it isn't something you can do efficiently. It's like the idea comes at some point, right? And it's, it's because you've been batting your head against it and trying all sorts of things. And sometimes then you're just like, uh, duh, I wish I, I, there's no uh. reason I couldn't have figured it out in the first hour but somehow there must be because you never figure it out in the first hour, Uh, or at least you spend all your time on those problems that you only think about that that way at the end. So if you wanna be reproductive in research, find the time, allow yourself the focus and 
don't do it holding your breath do it enjoying every step mm -hmm. sounds i personally really love programming so i think it'll be a it sounds like it will be good for me to find research that involves a lot of programming so that even if yeah. the research falls through at least i enjoyed the programming along the way right sort of like that uh grace has a question from the discord how did you know a career in research was right for you as opposed to industry yeah um i I don't have a high flute answer. I honestly don't like competition that much. I like cooperation and collaboration. I mean, I'm I'm like the next guy. I'll be competitive on on a game or you know in a little sparring match. But I didn't want that to be my career. And there was some industry culture that I saw from my engineering friends, which is a bit of like a one-upsmanship on, oh, I'm making more, oh, I have more companies. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, eh, not my thing. Uh -huh. I do like the notion that what I might do might be relevant. I'd love to have, you know, some new technology be enabled by my work. I, I really think that is inspiring to me. Um, and there used to be industrial, industrial research outfits that nurtured that, mm -hmm. um, but they were super, even then, even Bell Labs and IBM, they were super competitive. It was like, that was, that was fun for the people in them. And that's not my taste. So I just sort of said, yeah, I'm glad some people want to do that. I'm sure it makes them productive, but uh, I don't find that motivating. So I kind of knew I wanted to do academia. But I'm, I'm, I'm sure there must be some competition in academia. Like, for example, Jacob asks, like, how much pressure is there to publish as a professor? Is there like a certain kind of like, oh, I've published this many papers. And there's like, not I published this many papers, sort of like kind of boys competing uh, in the playground sort of mentality. Um, but like, yeah, yeah, I have I'm, a friend who calls it, they say it's like, there's a baboon troop out there. There's some sort of primal instinct that humans have to, to try and compete on that scale. So, you know, you can play that game. There's definitely faculty who do. Um, what I love about physics is that you don't have to, uh -huh. that there is uh, a lot of respect and esteem for the people who study deep and think hard and make progress, um, even on the thing that isn't the latest thing, right? Because real, transformations come out of left field. I mean, I don't think what Alan Heger was doing when he was starting to look at uh, conducting organic molecules was, you know, the thing everybody was trampling after. He was just, this is really cool. And I, I see this potential and it, he ran with it. And it, yeah, it was a beautiful success. I think that um, there, is, there is definitely that game available to you if you want to play it. There's no question, but you don't have to. I think that depends on how much you want the accolades that come with playing that. Um, my advisor gave me a lot of good advice, I feel, towards the end of my PhD. And one of them was, don't go for the Nobel Prize. Let it come to you, right? Because mm. people drive themselves crazy and destroy their families trying for the Nobel Prize. You don't want to live that way and I really I believe it I think that um, there's so much I love doing science and there's so much to enjoy about it um, I don't need to get my my thrills from one-upping my colleague that's uh, no fun uh, I like that too um, that's why I play a lot of co-op video games instead of competitive yeah. video games I think it's the exact yeah. same mentality um, for research um, what is your advice to undergraduates like freshmen and sophomore who are trying to get their foot in the door for research and having a hard time, especially during COVID? What is your advice to them to like trying to figure out like, do they like research? Like, how do I know um, if I like research, if I can't get into it because of like COVID or like lack of opportunity? It's like this catch 22. Like, how do you, how do you think people should go about trying to like, uh, address that situation and trying to make the best of their time at UCSB? 
Well, okay. Um, one thing I would say is don't be picky, right? There's a lot of research going on at UCSB. You don't have to do your research in physics proper to get a sense for whether or not you like research. Um, I've been advisor to cohorts of undergraduates for a couple decades, not, not two decades, but over a decade now. And I've seen students do really meaningful research experiences in music, in, uh, in biology, in engineering, in chemistry. Um, they're often, the physics education you get here is hard, uh, but it makes you really good and you tend to have um, the skills to really contribute in places like engineering labs where a lot of the students are really not interested in going into research. They wanna go out and get you know industrial jobs straight mm -hmm. out of college. So don't neglect uh, to look broadly to get involved. I really think you do have to beat the pavement and be persistent and not take things personally and, and ask, but you'll do yourself a big favor if you ask broadly, you know, just increase your pool. Um, and that's all you really need because, you know, you're not going to be taken on to a group as a graduate student for the undergraduate research you've done. It's just not going to be that way. Maybe one in a hundred students actually does their graduate studies in what they, they did as an undergraduate. It's much more common to move around um, because like, how do you even know what you want to study when you're just trying to learn first about research? It takes a little while to figure out first that you have the, the temperament that will let you go that long game and wait for those uh, gratifications that can be so delayed. Um, and once you figure that out, then you might want to figure out, you know, do you like the collaborative nature of the big science in high energy or astro, or do you like the tabletop size in soft bio or, atomic and all these things are, are, are taste driven and taste can come in later. So I guess biggest advice is be open-minded. Okay. Um, we have a few minutes left. I'd like to close with a couple of questions concerning graduate school. Um, the first one will be actually my personal question uh, from me. Um, as someone who's applying to grad school uh, this coming fall, I'm actually pretty interested in the Grad, grad student program at UCSB. Um, how feasible is it to go from an undergraduate at UCSB to a graduate student at UCSB? Like, does it happen? I know one case of, of it happening, but like, is it likely or should I not kind of hedge my bets on staying here uh, after my undergraduate studies? Okay, I would advise you don't stay. I. And I have a graduate student who was an undergraduate here. So, uh, you know, I'm not claiming infinite consistency here, but the point is there things are done differently when you move to different places in ways you don't really even know. And it's important to get other perspectives. Um, so I really think we, we don't do it often. And in general schools that do, it, it's kind of frowned upon because you know, you're, you're, you're becoming almost incestuous. You're only looking at your own students and thinking you're so wonderful that only your own students are good enough or whatever. It, it, it's not a great experience also for your students. It's just like, you know, living in one of the states of the United States and never exploring another state. You'd be so surprised. Things that you think of as optimized and fundamental like, I don't know, the way that the streets are labeled or something like the way that the toilets are, public toilets are arranged, are totally different in other states. And, and it just will change your worldview about what's core and what's trivial. So I think there's a lot to be gained by experiencing education in a different institution. It happens. I, I think every year there's one or two uh, students in our incoming graduate class that were undergraduates here. But um, yeah, you guys are good enough to, to go everywhere. And I think you probably should, you can, it's hard. I mean, the place is kind of paradisical, right? It's like beautiful and easy to stay happy because of the weather and the scenery and stuff. 
but it's neat to see how happy other people can be in places where the weather sucks. And, you know, it, it's, it's insightful and I think it's empowering. So, you know, don't be scared. Okay. Also, uh, there was some, okay. We only don't have that much time. So uh, yes. uh, last question. Um, this year was a particularly tough year for graduate students who are, or undergraduates trying to apply for grad school. Um, yeah. What do you suggest, uh, what do you suggest students who did not get into grad school this year do to best prepare to apply again next year? Okay, I'm gonna say something that's maybe uh, not politically correct, but honestly, I think taking the general GREs is a great idea. The hmm. general GREs are, the GREs are being vilified right now because there are studies that show that performance on them correlates more with features we don't want to select for than maybe with future success. And, you know, I haven't read those studies carefully. I don't know just um, how powerful or uh, much of a reach their conclusions are. But I do know from the side of trying to evaluate graduate students that it's very difficult to compare the A from University A with the A from College B. You know what I'm saying? One college, one university, two people with, you know, from University A, you have half A's and half B's. From College Z, you have all A's. Are those students equally prepared? Are, is an A the same thing? That's the advantage of these uh, standardized tests that I know they're a pain. I hated taking them too, but you, it does you know, help if you don't have straight A's, which very few of students come through our program with, then you might be surprised at how easy you find the general GREs and how much that can uh, help distinguish you as you know, someone who really has you know, learned most of the fundamentals as a good ability to learn and you know, just, it can shore up your package. Um, a lot of places will help, they tell me, will help you pay for those costs if, that, if you have a financial need. I think it, it, it's, um, it's not such a, a bad thing to do, uh, but it has been a weird year. And, you know, understandably taking those standardized tests wasn't in the cards. Maybe it won't ever be, maybe the, the forces of, um, social forces will eliminate those tests. Um, the other thing to do, you know, is to show that you use your time in a way that would be consistent with being a graduate student, like take on a big project and bring it to some kind of fruition. Mm. Um, that kind of stick to just the engineering problems you might have to solve, logistics or whatever to uh, actually, I don't know, make a, a 3D printed hovercraft that can stay aloft for two hours. I mean, I don't know what the deal is, but that might be um, something that you have to show for you were able to use your time in a way that required you to do some pretty hard problem solving that was somewhat physical. I think mm -hmm. that would help. Thank you. Um, it, is, it has been a little more than an hour. I would like to conclude the interview here. It has been a pleasure talking to you, Professor Fikerson, and uh, we would be happy if you continue to interact with our Discord. And I just want to say thank you, Kyle, and all the Discord users out there. The kind of social environment you've created for our department through the Discord is amazing and oh, so you. healthy, and we really value it as a department. And I'm, um, I'm working to help my. Uh, social media challenged colleagues find their way around because I think this is a different form of posting things in the elevator <laughs> is posting things in the discord and running into people in the elevator is running into them on the discord. Oh yes. And it could really help us um, get to know each other more as people. Yes. Tell them that um, we have 700 members. So if they need a position filled, they'll get it very quickly filled if they post here as opposed to posting <laughs> in the elevator. 
<laughs> right. Um, because not everyone goes in the elevator. Not every like people just go. No, I don't. Like my lab's on the second floor. I'm always walking up the stairs. Yeah. I always feel blindsided. Yeah. All right. Uh, All right. We're going to end it here. Thank you, Professor Feigenstein. Thanks, Scott. And uh, for the viewers that are watching, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. No, I'm just kidding. No, we don't have that kind of feature <laughs> here. Um, just uh, let us know how we did and we'll see you next time. And our next AMA will be Friday with uh, the text-based AMAs with Professor Dong, Professor Young, uh, Professor Brandit, Professor Balance, and Professor Kochalagas. Uh, all five of them will be there. And we guys hope you have a good day. See you Thanks later. Bye-bye.